Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Jerch, and I'm the director for the Center for Policy and Practice here at the Association of Community College Tra uh, Trustees. Thank you so much for joining us today. So over the past two years, the Association of Community College Trustees and Education Strategy Group led the Non-Credit and Credit Alignment Lab a two-year initiative to support 20 community colleges and four community college systems in developing new or improved pathways between non-credit and credit programs. Participating community college leaders have been working to eliminate the silos that too often exist across non-credit and credit divisions, guided by ESG's A More Unified Community College Framework. ACCT embarked on this project because we recognize the critical and increasing importance non-degree and non-credit credentials play in our post-secondary ecosystem. We also recognize that more is needed to support staff, faculty, instructors, and importantly, students in non-credit programs. We view non-credit and credit alignment as a strategy and means to help more learners achieve actualized economic mobility. I'm joined today by my colleagues from the Education Strategy Group to discuss the lessons learned from the Non-Credit and Credit Alignment Lab. Specifically, Annie Phillips, Director of Post-Secondary Attainment, will be moderating today's panel and facilitating questions from the audience. Annie Phillips joined Education Strategy Group in 2017 to support work that fosters collaboration among K-12, higher education, and workforce stakeholders. Annie and her team have been crucial partners in helping sites make and maintain progress over the last 18 months. Before I turn it over to Annie to get us started, so here's just a couple little logistics to keep in mind. We will be recording this webinar and sending it out and posting it at a later date. And please enter any questions you have into the chat for our moderator and the panelists. With that, I'll turn it over to Annie to get things started. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, really appreciate the introduction. I know me and my colleagues at ESG have been honored to partner with ACCT to lead the Non-Credit and Credit Alignment Lab, NCAL, um, colloquially. So for those who don't know ESG, we're a mission-driven consulting firm who believes a high school diploma is no longer enough to be successful in today's economy. And we work with state school districts and post-secondary institutions to better align systems of education and work so that more learners can earn a high quality post-secondary credential. Now, how NCAL sits in all this, um, you know, it's an initiative support that supports community colleges across our nation in investigating what it actually takes to align those systems, right? Break down the silos and better align non-credit and credit functions um, on community college campuses so that more learners can progress along high quality pathways to longer term credentials and degrees. To guide this work, um, Steve mentioned a more unified community college, which was our guidebook, um, and actually ACCT was on the advisory committee for the development of this white paper that laid out five elements that we believe lead to stronger alignment. These elements were laid out um, in, in the paper, as I mentioned, and aggregated from findings from dozens of institutions to summarize what good alignment between non-credit and credit actually looks like. The big takeaway um, that I uh, talk about a lot is that good alignment is much more than just non-credit to credit articulation, right? It is about authentic pathways that require one, treating non-credit students as equal to credit students, right? Many students in non-credit would benefit from services like tutoring, access to the library, access to the gym, which often just because they don't have a college ID means they can't actually engage in those college uh, services and supports. The second, build clear pathways between non-credit and credit. Um, we talked about this as credentials in a more unified community college, um, and credentials matter, but actually how we've evolved our thinking on this is to be more around how we communicate these pathways, right, through advising and other communications through faculty and instructors. The third element of our framework is aligned departments and governance. This is about aligning those operational functions, right, as demonstrated through joint leadership, through shared data systems, and other coordinated processes of your staff and faculty. Uh, fourth, make programs credit worthy or credit based. Yes, this is the articulation piece, but make that as automatic or partially automatic as possible to avoid sort of barriers for the learners. And finally, remove those barriers to transition. And these are things like 
related to actual business office functions of finances as they relate between non-credit and credit, financial aid challenges, registration challenges between non-credit and credit. All of these things matter um, to either facilitate or sometimes impede on learners moving across pathways. And our goal with NCAL was to put that theory to test, right? The theory of if you do these five things, more learners will progress and understand what it actually takes to operationalize this somewhat theoretical framework. So in thinking about NCAL, um, you know, more specifically about the lab, it was designed to help community colleges across the country align their non-credit and credit programming through both peer networking, right? So we brought all these colleges together, but also individualized coaching. Each site was assigned a coach who helped them do the following. One set of vision, right? One of the things we learned is just how critical it is for non-credit and credit alignment to be um, not just a siloed initiative on the side, but really integrated into the larger student success mission at the college. Each college did a capacity self-assessment to see where they fell on a number of key strategies and then created these actionable plans to sort of uh, live out that vision. The second, Increase cross-functional ownership for alignment between non-credit and credit. This came in through intentionally designed teams. So all colleges were required to have both non-credit and credit faculty and instructors, but we also conducted student focus groups to integrate student voice into that ownership piece, as well as bring in our IR folks to talk about data, and we'll explain a little bit more on that. And then finally, right, those coaches help them implement that vision. So this could be adapting your backend infrastructure, right, those operational pieces, the governance and collaboration of faculty, embedding non-credit credentials and credit programs, process mapping to understand barriers, and many more. We have a great panel today who's going to talk a little bit more about this. As far as who was engaged in our cohort, um, we included 14 what we call governance units, basically systems districts and individual campuses. Altogether, we had 20 colleges and four systems engaged in NCAL. You can see from this map, we had quite a variety um, geographically, right, from out west in Hawaii, um, all the way to uh, North Shore, Massachusetts, uh, here in, in Mass. Um, we also had a diversity of sizes in institutions, everything from a very large district like San Diego um, Community College District to our small but mighty uh, Antoinette colleagues at Vance Granville Community College in North Carolina. We'll have two of those college, colleges talking to us today. Now, this webinar is to talk about lessons learned from the lab, and we released um, some briefs, which uh, we'll, we'll share again uh, with the full group. Um, but I'd like to quickly go through highlights, and then we'll have a chance to dig in a little bit deeper with our colleges on the call. I mentioned earlier that each site created this vision for alignment. Um, and one of the reflections we had uh, on the whole NCAL initiative was just how important incorporating student voice was into those visions. So as a part of the NCAL initiative, we conducted focus groups with over 80 learners who had started in non-credit to hear what they thought worked and maybe didn't work to help them move between non-credit and credit. And what we learned was even this act of focus grouping or surveying learners in non-credit not typical. Um, even, uh, you know, the act of focus grouping was additive for these colleges and something we do recommend to colleges who are just looking to get started on work for alignment. We had a number of findings um, that are on the slide here um, about, right, what learners in non-credit told us, um, everything from we want more support services to the importance of faculty. But I think really what I want to emphasize is Many learners who start in non-credit want degrees, right? They, um, we often think that um, non-credit students are just there to get a few skills and go back to the workforce, which is true for many of them, but not all. And we learned that we've got to design systems that are uh, uh, designed to address both needs in learners. Another highlight from the lab is how many sites chose to focus on how they're communicating non-credit and credit pathways. We found that too often a pathway, if it did exist, was you know, communicated on this like hidden place on their website, took a lot of clicks to get there, if it was even on the website at all. And staff weren't proactively communicating these pathways to learners. And so many of our sites in the lab strengthened advising and communication to make sure that Students who started in non-credit knew what their next step was on the path, and we'll hear some great strategies for that from our panel today. 
Number three, um, we had this very important finding that a number of faculty and staff who work in non-credit reported feeling more integrated into their campus community after participating in this lab. I mentioned we conducted this capacity assessment upfront that asked questions about what routines do credit and non-credit faculty and instructors have at your institution? How often is non-credit programming a standing agenda item that you talk about? Um, we just conducted this assessment again, and I'll tell you, really cool, overwhelmingly, we saw sites respond much more affirmatively to these types of questions. And anecdotally, as we talk to sites directly, we're hearing that as well. And I think it's difficult to say exactly what the impact of this better integration will be on learners, but our hope is that feeling more a part of the community will lead to better collaboration between faculty and staff across non-credit and credit and clearer lines of communication that will ultimately trickle down to the learner. Number four on our list, and yes, um, I will admit this, you know, while articulation uh, between credit and non-credit programs is not the only thing that will lead to alignment, it is a really important part of the puzzle to creating pathways between the two. And so I'd be remiss not to mention the fact that um, over 20 new articulation agreements were created between non-credit and credit um, across all the sites in NCAL and our colleagues from Minnesota State are here today to share a bit more on how they really doubled down on this. And then finally, if you're listening to this webinar, you're likely aware that non-credit data is not nearly as sophisticated as credit data. And that is largely due to the differences we see in how funding and reporting works um, in our systems of higher ed. Um, you know, it's not the only thing, but it plays, it plays a big part. And while we can't necessarily claim victory on creating new non-credit standards for data collection, um, we did learn a couple things that we think are additive to the field. One is around student intake forms and in non-credit. We worked with a lot of our colleges to try and disaggregate their non-credit data to understand certain outcomes among certain populations. Too often, student intake is so simplified that we're not even asking simply for race and ethnicity. We worked with some of our colleges to add that into intake forms so that, you know, long term, they can do a better job of disaggregating outcomes and engaging in on, uh, ongoing improvement. Number two is around definitions and just how important it is to create a common understanding at the college of definitions for quote unquote workforce non-credit programs, right? Um, it's not necessarily the case that a vocational programs like pottery and basket weaving are going to be the programs you hope to articulate or create pathways from. And so knowing the difference between adult basic education non-credit, workforce non-credit, and then personal enrichment non-credit is really important to moving this work along. And then finally, information systems. Um, basically, making sure that you have systems to track learners between non-credit and credit is really important for this work, right? And we saw a lot of different ways that this can play out at colleges, everything from full integration of the student information system in non-credit to the credit student information system, to providing unique identifiers for learners um, when they start in non-credit so that they can eventually be tracked, to even using right the same student information system like Banner in some of the cases that we saw for both non-credit and credit. And all of these we believe do start to move the field's knowledge forward on right how, how we can better standardize and understand what's happening in non-credit. And so with that, um, those are kind of the high level findings. Um, I do want to introduce our panel to you all today. Um, really excited that they're here to join us. Starting off is Antoinette Dickens, who is the department chair um, of public service at Vance Granville Community College. Antoinette is a product of VGCC herself um, and has been employed with the college for a total of 14 years. She's currently the department chair of public service, as I mentioned, a paralegal technology instructor and work-based learning coordinator for curriculum programs. In addition to the NCAL grant, Antoinette serves on a host of initiatives and committees to improve students' experiences at VGCC. 
Next up is Dr. Jacqueline Hester, Dean of Child Development at San Diego College of Continuing Education. Jackie is a versatile leader who can turn a vision into reality with her transformative leadership. As the resident and instructional dean of the uh, um, child development programs at San Diego College of Continuing Education, Jackie oversees the second largest academic program in the college with over a decade of experience in higher education and several years of administrative experience. She previously served as the Dean of Community um, Education Programs at Kennedy King College, City Colleges of Chicago. Jacqueline has extensive experience managing internal operations, vendor contracts, and grants. She is also skilled in assessing financial controls and budgets effectiveness. Welcome, Jackie. And then finally, Larry Hanslin, Director of Adult College Readiness with the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Larry is the Director of Adult Learner Equity Strategies and Strategic Partnerships with a focus on improving admissions and support of adult students throughout the system. He continues that work and has added managing NCAL and uh, their 3M learning pathways to college for um, underrepresented adult learners, grants, creating pathways from workforce training at CBOs, uh, for credit awards in Minnesota State. Hanlon has over 20 years of experience in higher education, including enrollment management, higher education research, program development, program marketing, and grant management. Welcome, everyone. We're, of course, so glad that you're here to join us and tell us more about all the amazing things you've accomplished in NCAL. So just to start us off, you know, I mentioned the importance of the vision for alignment and that this is an integrated part of a college or Larry, in your case, systems, strategic priorities. Talk to me about why your site is prioritizing non-credit and credit alignment right now. And actually, Larry, since you're kind of coming from a unique vantage point at a system, I'd love to start with you. Larry, you're on mute. I on mute, of course. First person had to do it. Um, for us, a big part of this was is that we are facing um, increased interest. I would say not pressure, but interest from our our state legislator. They've been really interested in how we're we're developing uh, for workforce and um, how we're reaching out to business. And so, not only how, were we doing NCAL, but we also created an entirely new division that my my unit is a part of from Act. They separated us from academic affairs, and now we're in a workforce and uh, a workforce division on our, our own and have a new executive director, everything on top. INCAL really fits into that, though, is that we provide a tremendous number of contacts and services with both businesses and state government in the state of Minnesota. And so it's been really having, experiencing that and really starting to um, look at how we could best support those both state government and private businesses has been a critical part of it. But then also we're having enrollment challenges. Minnesota, um, while it's not as bad as some of the, or having as many difficulties as some of the places in the Midwest, Minnesota is, is seeing an aging population um, and enrollment is a challenge for us. And so this is another look for enrollment. We have incredibly uh, strong or incredibly strong employment numbers. And so we don't have we have to find new workers where they are. And that is um, really in the workforce and then moving them into hopefully our, our institutions. And I'm sorry, I went on there for a bit. Antoinette, I see you. I saw you nodding your head on the enrollment challenge. You wanna talk about why VGCC is interested in this and maybe too sort of understanding, right? We have a, a large system in Minnesota and then Vance Granville is located in a you know rural suburban um, environment in North Carolina. Exactly. Thank you, Annie. Yes, we are obviously are experiencing some of those same enrollment challenges, but we're prioritizing um, non-credit to credit alignment because we recognize the role that the non-credit courses attract these students to college to kind of upskill with their current employer or either to transition to other, um, other new positions. And so then we're working also with our community stakeholders to ensure that we are providing them exactly what they need with their um, employees as well. Also, um, when we were, were reviewing our data a few years ago regarding our um, retention and persistence, it revealed that our students were not returning and completing to the college's satisfaction, 
And so the condensed version is we investigated the matter and subsequently wind up transitioning to an eight week model, which allowed students to kind of complete quickly because we found out that they were kind of getting tired midway through the 16 week semester. And so when we transitioned to that model, we had some of those um, uh, articulation, articulated classes. And so logically, we would have to strategically realign those classes as well so that they would actually match those um, curriculum classes as well and to also ensure their relevancy and feasibility since we were using those kind of as a pipeline um, for our curriculum programs. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, that's an interesting insight. So sort of program changes you're making to me, you know, I think both theoretical and like actual demand from learners required you to think more deeply about how to create alignment, almost taking right some of the really good aspects that's already happening in non credit it's flexibility, different start times throughout the year, um, and think about how do we bring those over to credit in a more thoughtful way. Jackie? Yeah, so ours is a little bit uh, different, of course. Um, so within our district, we have three credit colleges and our continuing actually sits as its own college. So what made this a great opportunity for us, of course, because it was in our chancellor's strategic plan. So when NCAL came about, it was a win-win for us because, you know, a lot of times we have these initiatives, but it's like, where do we start? So NCAL really was our, our North Star to really help us get moving and to really find, and to be intentional about some of the work that we wanted to do. So of course, you know, we have our students who transition from our, our, our non-credit college to credit. But one thing I think really helped us was really to be intentional to make decisions that are data informed. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we were just super excited for this opportunity because it came right at the same time we were really looking at this when our strategic plan rolled out and what better way to use this to, to leverage that. Excellent. So yeah, just kind of summarizing, I think two big things making this urgent, right? Leadership prioritization, whether that's the chancellor of your college, the legislature, lots of governors prioritizing workforce, and this, I would say, almost urgency to change from the enrollment perspective, the tight labor market, right? The need to switch to eight-week courses to meet learners' needs, but also the needs of employers. So thank you for kind of laying that out um, so clearly for the listeners. Um, I mentioned too, and, and Jackie, you started to talk about how you really wanted to focus on data. So maybe we can start with you on these action plans, right? So we set this vision through NCAL for alignment. We had fun getting together in Washington, D.C. to see everyone's different plans. Um, and you, you identified through those plans a set of priorities. Can you share with the group, right, what strategies did you pursue to better align non-credit and credit? Um, I think first off, I think when we went through the whole process, I think it's important to really talk about how the self-assessment, you know how sometimes you know you know what it is, you know, when we really began to dive in to do, look at that uh, self-assessment, I'm really looking at the NCAL framework, and I think most intentional was really looking at our data. Um, we conducted a focus group, um, so our two pathways we looked at was our child development and healthcare. And then that um, we already had some articulation agreements with the colleges, but what we found out through our data was we have this great thing, but our students don't know. And if we're here to serve our students, how do we be intentional about ensuring on the front end that our students know? And so one thing we did when we formulated this was to really make sure we had all key stakeholders at the table. So we had our student services team. We had um, our institution of research, which was Mark. I have to shout out Mark because he really kind of, we had ongoing conversations. He said, what are we looking at? And really asking those critical questions to really push us to be intentional about we need to hear student voices. So one of that we'll talk a little bit more about. Well, we did our focus groups. Um, we looked at quantitative and qualitative data and the data really showed us something like, hey, you have all these students who are taking your non-credit courses, but you don't have a lot of them are transitioned to the college credit and actually looking at the end result of looking at our, our student retention. Are they actually doing completions um, with, with the graduation rate and actually going and getting degrees? And so that was one of the things we really were intentional about. And so one of the things we looked at was, promoting our child development pathway. Um, the students that we currently have, do they know about these opportunities that are available for them? Our messaging. And really the last one was granting students um, access to key, key resources across campuses. So one of the things that really helped us identify our students necessarily didn't have that sense of belonging. Um, they didn't have the ID cards that you mentioned. So really looking at the NCAL framework, help us really see our gaps and really areas of opportunity as a district in a whole. So not separated by college, but really as a district, what can we do better to service our students to transition through this pipeline? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning using data to show in a way like this lost opportunity. We have all these learners who are here at our college and we're not moving them forward even when an, an articulation exists, but comms, messaging, support services. Uh, Larry, how, how did you all uh, sort of structure your action plan? I think Dr. Hester really hit on a couple things that really helped us was understanding that we didn't have a really good connection to our student services. And that's something we're still working on and will be for a while. Uh, but especially as a system, our you know we don't we don't control what happens on our campuses. We've got we've got to make sure that they're they're seeing the advantages of it, and we're getting there. But that was one of the things that really struck out struck to us stuck out to us that we needed to do better um, in the planning. Though one of the big things we did um, was to really use our faculty, and so that was it allowed us to pay our faculty to determine those pathways. And for us, that's really essential because we are a highly unionized environment and they have to be reimbursed for, for the work that, that we expect them to do. And so um, really using those faculty who were in similar fields to determine what had to be in that non-credit that wasn't already there to ensure that students were both getting the credit getting a good educational value in the non-credit program, but also that they were ready for the credit work when they came into it. And that really, I think, um, besides the things that Dr. Hester really mentioned there, that was one of the things I would say stuck out, stood out to us was the importance of having the faculty drive the academic choices, especially, and then letting them kind of see that we were trying to help their students as well along the way and bring in more students. Yes, and I know we really want to dig in because you all like revamped your credit for prior learning policy, and I know that's a pretty hot topic right now. So we do want to dig in more on that. But but first, maybe Antoinette, can you tell us a little bit um, about some of how Vance Granville approached the work? Certainly. Well, one of the first things we noticed, uh, to Dr. Hester's point, is we noticed that there was kind of an imbalance of how we treated our continuing education or nine credit students there. And even when it came to tracking their information as well. And so what we worked to do was to develop a a cohort cord identifier and colleague to actually improve our ability to track the qualitative data on those nine credit students, because we would have like the information where they registered and where they've completed, but then it just kind of sat there in that little portal and it didn't really cross over for them to get those credits. And so And we also um, enacted a process where it allowed the students, once once they successfully completed those articulated classes, that they were automatically granted credit um, for those classes on the curriculum side. So that was just wonderful. And one of the things that helped us to do that is that we actually um, sat down and had one of our program heads and also faculty members to do a mapping process for us to establish like that benchmark where we are. And it was just amazing what we learned from that process and how from the, you know, we're educators here and we were like, oh my goodness, is this what it looks like for our students? And they don't even know what we know. And so it really made us take a step back and start delving in deeper and diving in to see what we need to do. And that led us to our second strategy, which we pulled directly from the framework, was to treat all students as students. Um, There was a disparity (laughs) in terms of the resources that were provided for our nine credit students. Um, And as we'll talk about a little later, some of the things that we are putting into place now to try to meet some of those gaps. Um, But we did recognize that even down to the the website, registration processes and things of that nature were all just kind of barriers for them and created a more complicated process for them. And so again, it's a continuous process. It's something we'll continue to work on, but again, it was something that was brought to our attention and we recognized the need to actually to change that. Our uh, next one was intentional marketing of nine credit to credit pathways. And I can't remember if it was Dr. Hester or Larry that said that, like we have all these wonderful articulation agreements, 
but as students and community really don't know about them and they don't really know the differences between the two and what this may lead to. And so we're working on improving our marketing on that as well so that we can embrace like that common language so that these individuals be able to understand what it is that we're offering, where they can start and where this can actually take them. And then our last one is our evaluation uh, reveal that our um, mechatronics <laughs> articulation agreements were kind of not essential. <laughs> they were no longer really valid. And so we had to go back and actually reevaluate that and actually created several new, I think about five, five or so additional articulation agreements based on this NCAL alignment project, which, you know, kind of forced us to kind of look at those again and just like, okay, we really need to update these. These are no longer valid and we need to make sure that they're valid meeting the needs of the employers and the students. Excellent. Thanks for sharing those. And I do on your student supports piece, um, what I was mentioning earlier about student focus groups and this discovery that there are many learners who start in non-credit who want degrees, right? They're coming in. What we heard pretty consistently was there is a not insignificant number who are coming to test out college. And so to Jackie's point about, oh, we have this missed opportunity, we're not bringing them over. Um, and, to, and to Antoinette's point about investing in student services, right? We haven't necessarily done that to date because the assumption is these learners, again, are just here quick courses and then back off into the workforce. But right, if we do want to encourage those who are kind of taking a leap of faith and trying out to see if college is for them, um, to try and engage them and support them along this pathway. And again, creating systems that encourage, yes, maybe you want to go back out into the workforce. Great. We're going to prepare you for that. But also if you're not, if you're trying to see if additional education and training is for you, we're also here to support you in that way. And so I know we've really um, looked to Vance Granville as a leader in, in how they're thinking about that. Um, quickly, maybe just kind of one, one thing from each of you, an early win that you achieved. So you laid out for us, like we set these plans. Um, sometimes plans don't always, you know, go as, as you expect them to, but maybe Larry, starting with you, what's an early win you achieved from this work? We were able to get um, the three campuses we were working with, especially, were able to create kind of um, ongoing discussions with the with the non-credit and credit side of our administration. And those are two sides that are very far apart traditionally. And so, getting them into the same room and discussing some of the same same issues and seeing how easily it actually could be done was a huge advantage for us. It's not, it's not as hard as you think. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Once we got them there, they were, they actually had quite a bit to talk about and move forward on. So. Yeah. I think once you get past the, you know, uh, the way we've always done it, right. Like that, that, um, sort of impression or, or philosophy, the reality is, yeah, just, it sometimes just takes a conversation. Jackie, how about you? What, what's your maybe number one kind of early win? For oh, this is so hard. Cause I have more than one. I was running the list really fast. So what I have to say, our early win was, I think our infrastructure, usually when you have initiatives like this that are huge, it kind of goes like from the top down approach. This one was really a bottom up. So I think at the time our VP, VP Michelle Fishtall was intentional about making sure that we included our faculty in here as well as our deans. And again, I talked about our student services. I think the next one, we did a listening tour. Um, we got together, our vice chancellor let us have a meeting with all of our vice presidents throughout the district who's doing this work of instruction and student services. Um, the last one, few when I say Dr. King, she, um, our president really took the, uh, Took the bull by the horns we started what is called our in-cal symposium with all of our credit colleges where we all come to the table the campus presidents and their and their staff and faculty come in and we talk about you know what are our next steps moving through the whole in-cal process which has been great and i think our last one i would have to say is um we've been doing listening tours masa and myself with our faculty to really talk about this who do the day-to-day -day work so again i have to shout out our entire team um, we like to call ourselves the NCAL champions. And so even though once this grant will end, we're still continuing to do the work um, on some things that we set within our action plan. So super excited. So we had a lot of wins, I must say. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, that takes me back. The point I was making about faculty non-credit feeling more integrated into the college, like how that can have 
potential ripple effects, ideally, right, and all the way to the student who, right, can take advantage of an instructor who, yeah, knows a little bit about credit or knows a little bit about what's happening on the non-credit side. Um, so do appreciate that. And your point about the bottom-up approach, do you want to say, you know, the um, a more unified community college guide that we have does have a guide for faculty and staff, right? If you're in the mighty middle, you can get this work started as well. Antoinette, what about you? What's your what's your early one? And you are allowed more than one, I suppose. Okay, good. <laughs> well, my first one, I do have to shout out the team because we had a very successful BioWorks um, information session, which led to one of the highest enrollments for our BioWorks um, non-credit to credit class. And we were so very excited about that. And we've been duplicating that based on our plans that we've been working with. So, and we want to just kind of use that template and tweak it as we go along so that we can, so that we can continue that momentum there. But also our other win and mad shout out to Dr. Damaris is that she, um, after we would have our briefing, saw the need to create a position um, that would assist the continuing education or non-credit students with this registrar advisor position because that was a piece that was lacking and I don't know if I want to jump around too much because I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later but that was a huge win and for that decision to be made so early on in the process to identify that and then take that type of action was absolutely wonderful. So those, I'll stop right there, are my top two wins for, for NCAL. So yeah, the registrar advisor, let's talk about it because it is it is a really unique, I think, strategy coming out of this. And we saw, we saw it play out in a couple of different ways in, in different colleges, right? Some are really investing in, you know, coaches in non-credit for learners, right? Kind of academic career. Vance Granville did this registrar advisor. Talk to us about how that's helping to create more of this one college experience that I know Dr. Damaris talks about quite a bit at Vance Granville. Yeah, so that is part of our one student services model that they are, we're actually working on um, transitioning to, we're kind of in the foundational stages of that, but this is where this, um, this position comes in. And the specific component of this model is to ensure that the non-credit students receive the assistance and the resources that they need for successful completion. And like I said, when we did our mapping process, they were unfortunately bounced around from this person, bounced around. There was no one dedicated person to provide assistance to them. And in addition to this uh, registrar advisor, there's also the training of our advisors, our counselors, and even staff, again, with this common language so that all of them can provide the type of services and resources. So it doesn't, we're uh, kind of decentralized here. We, our campuses are abroad. We have campuses in different counties. But uh, again, the need to have everyone on the same page so that whether a student comes to our Henderson campus or our Warren County campus, they're going to receive the same information. They're going to receive the same type of service. And I'm just so proud to be part of this to see that we're really getting, taking the information and the data that we pull from NCAL and using this to improve services for all of our students, actually, because this is not only going to benefit our non-credit students, but it's also going to be benefit our curriculum students. Well, yeah, I think that's a really creative solution. And do you just want to um, put a shout out to throw your questions in the chat? I know we're getting a couple already, but we are going to hold a little bit of time towards the end to answer them. So don't be shy. Um, Jackie, I want to go back to the data. Um, and I know some, some people find this really interesting. I know I do. Um, talk to us a little bit about what San Diego Community College or College of Continuing Education has done around non-credit data and specifically how you were able to sort of accomplish collecting such high quality information on your learners and non-credit and how you've leveraged that data to drive change at the college. Absolutely. So again, I have to shout out Mark for this, Mark Gabriel. Um, we've had so many conversations about this. Um, and again, Mark accessed those critical questions. So we were doing some work prior to the NCAL, um, but it, now I think this, this kind of helped propel us to the next level of really looking at it um, because it had uh, myself and Masa, he's the dean at the credit college and myself at the non-credit. And so what we began to do, he started to really show us the data. Um, one of the things he says, okay, we have a lot of the data 
the quantitative side, but let's look at the qualitative. Let's really hear our students' voices. Let's ask those critical questions that sometimes we're afraid to ask our students because we really want to know the truth. And so one of the things during the time, I remember us having that conversation, VP Fishtaw said, are we doing this just another initiative? Are we really doing this to impact change? And what the data really, you know, we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what the data really showed us was that a lot of our students are participate in non-credit, we're students of color. And so we're really gonna be intentional in impacting these students. What is the data telling us? We know the data telling us what our, what our student demographics looks like. Okay, they're coming in, they're completing our non-credit, but are they actually going on? And so one of the things I'm um, during that conversation, our Dean Cassandra at the time with healthcare, she says, well, you know what? We keep assuming that our students want this. Let's just do a small analysis and let's survey our students now who are currently in our program, what they wanna know. And what they found is, they want to move transition from our CNA program to our RN, which is our LP, LPN program. But how do they do that? They don't know how. They don't know the next steps. Um, what we found out even in our child development was, okay, our students were enrolled in credit by exam classes. A few of them didn't know that. And so how do we be intentional? So we work with our registration office. So once the students now click on a certain class, it gives them the disclaimer, hey, you're now enrolled in a credit by exam class. Um, we received a buy-in from our faculty to talk about it the first week of class. They embedded in their students, um, their, their, actually their course syllabus. Another key takeaway was um, our counselors was at the table. Our counselors said, well, you know what? We're going to be intentional about um, talking about this through our counseling sessions to our students. So we had multiple entry points and levels where our students can kind of get this information. But again, if it wasn't for the data and telling us, you know, what our students are experiencing, we would never known that. So again, shout out to the team. Everybody took a, a part in that and really own it. And I think that's important to really own the part and the piece that you have in the puzzle. And I think our team really knew exactly, you know, where they fit. And so we've been actually moving forward. And we've seen an increase now in our students um, transitioning to our credit college using their credit by exam classes. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the outcome we want to see, right? We put in all this work and we do want to see learners who we, you know, uh, sometimes assume sometimes in the case of San Diego, we have actual data that says they aspire to move towards this next credential, next degree. And so, you know, ultimately achieving that is is the goal. And I love how you used, you talked about it started with the data, but then we're communicating it in the syllabus, we're offering credit, we're doing the advising with the counselors, right? Um, and it is it is this full package, right? Uh, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet, but once you get that momentum going, it's much easier. And the fact that you did it with uh, CNA to LPN, which people love to talk about that pathway, but if you dig into the data, progression often is quite low, which you know, can can create real, I think, e equity issues um, long term. Uh, but the fact that you all are are diving into that head first, I think, is a huge accomplishment. So thanks for sharing that. Quickly, you know, I know you all have made those data pretty readily available to staff and faculty in, to inform decision making. How have you all done that at the college? Um, that has been ongoing. Even with our meetings, we lead off with the data. Um, one of the things we did with convocation, that was one thing Dr. King wanted to be strategic about, um, leading with the data, L letting the faculty know, um, letting everybody know, you know where we are, what's our standpoint, um, as well as even with our symposiums, you know, talking about the data, looking at how we have progressed over time, and again, looking at what our areas of opportunity. So pretty much all of our meetings, um, even that we have with our coach with Callista, you know, it leads us back, hey, to the data, where we are, are we making progression, right? Because it tells a story. Um, and it's just, we want to just make sure, and I think the reason why we talk about data so much is we want to make sure that we do it right the first time, right? Because we have students and we know that we're impacting lives. And so we really want to be intentional about making sure that we provide these services that we say we are for our students to be successful. Excellent. Excellent. And Larry, the, C the CPL policy, I know you all took this system-wide approach, um, to your credit for prior learning, to focus on kind of professional workforce development, catering to adult basic education students, immigrants, and other learners and workforce aligned programs. Why revise your CPL policy now? And I think more importantly, how did you engage the campus leaders in the exercise? Sure. I want to say one thing first on Dr. Hester's there. One of the big things for us having that data is we've been able to take it to our um, to all of our student services folks on the four credit or what were traditionally four credit, just say, here are the students we're looking for. We're already engaging with them. This is how, you know, let's mm -hmm. bring them in. But sorry, I just had to add that because it was 
it was yeah, uh, really helpful. So uh, for us, a big part of it was um, we've had increasing interest from state legislators, much like we have in general. And so a few years ago, we created, um, we have centers of excellence for different areas of, um, of study. So uh, agriculture, um, energy, uh, IT, all those. One of them that we created though was a center, was a center that was for credit for prior learning. And CPLAN is what it's called. And it's basically a small funded organization that actually exists on one of our campuses. And they go out and basically um, provide support and ensure that um, that credit for prior learning, um, if there's technical questions, they kind of overcome it. Adding to that, then we've created, we've been in the process of creating a system that that collects and basically um, keeps all those forms of what, what you might call articulation agreements. We hate using that term because they tend not to work very well for us. Articulation agreements have been one thing between one agency and another. What we've tried to do with CPLAN is create this credit for prior learning that works um, system-wide. Uh, and it, not on every campus is gonna work quite the same way, but each time we create one of these pathways, it goes into our new system. And then that system is available for people to review and look at. It can both reduce the amount of time that faculty have to review those sorts of things. It can also just provide um, knowledge that they might be able to get credit at a different campus for if we don't have that specifically. So a big part of this was creating this infrastructure of the, or the organization itself and then creating this database that's going to provide us with even more. Um, and then going out to campuses, we've been doing a traveling roadshow with some of our um, some of our folks who've gone out to each campus and demonstrated it um, both to faculty, students, and administrators. And as they've done that, it's it's created at least um, it's taken away a lot of the complexity that people saw there, and provided them a simple answer about where to go and how to do it. Um, and so the legislator got us started, like many things, but it really has helped us. Um, communicate better with ourselves even. And so the big part of that, um, it's been a, you know, became a strategic part of part of our strategic plan. But creating that center really provided us with the resources for and for people to go, a, a place to go, or a, at least some people to go to that people could talk to and talk through the challenges they were facing. Because for a lot of faculty, C plan was daunting more, CPL was daunting more because it, um, they didn't understand exactly what it meant. And now that we have these examples and these resources, it's made it much easier for them as a resource. Yeah, and would you say this was a big expense um, to the system? Uh, obviously t a lot of time investment. Yeah. So it's about, th I think we've got four people and somehow affiliated, I think. So it is four lines of budget, which is not nothing by any means. For system-wide, um, it's even not nothing for that, but it's not it's not so huge that it, it's, um, when we say a center, some people think of that as being, you know, 20 people. Um, ours are usually three to four to five people working on different projects. And so it's an expense, but, but a fairly reasonable one. And as we're working with it, we're also looking at ways to maybe recover some of those expenses without charging students for it. So there's different ways to kind of fund it, um, but but it hasn't been terribly expensive for us, though not free either. Yeah, no, I, I was just curious because I, I love this example because it shows what a system can really bring to the table in terms of yeah. scale, right? Your point like, oh, articulation agreements, they're good, they're great, but... <laughs> Um, you got to go, you got to go program by program, basically. Um, and what you're describing, I mean, the potential multiplier effect, even between institutions is really, exactly. is, it really speaks to, I think, sort of next generation kind of credit mobility and how we need to be thinking about, um, yeah, the mobility of our learners. So, so and, we'll appreciate you saying that. And we have some of our students who do that, who take uh, online courses at our several different institutions now. And so um, they're starting to find ways. If we didn't organize it, they were going to do it themselves. <laughs> and that may not turn out as well as we'd like as, as doing it this way. 
Absolutely. Well, I know we have a couple of questions from the audience that I want to get to here. So starting with the first question we got, which is about competition. And I often get this question whenever we speak on non-credit and credit alignment, the fact that sometimes there is competition between non-credit and credit staff for resources, for students. How are you addressing this at your institution um, or in, in the system in your case, Larry? Our, our biggest thing is really just demonstrating these are the students we're looking for. Um, we keep talking about the students who are underrepresented adult learners who we have a hard time finding. Turns out they're on our non-credit side. And so the, the real thing is to turn that around and say, it's not competition. They We literally have the students that we say we're seeking over here. How do we move them from the non-credit side over to the credit side at the same time? And that's a lot of what I'm doing with also with the 3M grant. It's just, it's, I ju and part of this is I was just looking at some data before we got on here. And it's stunning to me when I look at those numbers that if we had those, you know, even half of those numbers in our four credit programs, we would be so much better off as an institution. So mm -hmm. sorry, I just mm -hmm. got me started on something I was working on. <laughs> well, and I may I may <laughs> next go to a question that we we just got, but um, competition. Antoinette, Jackie, do you have anything else you'd add to that? Yeah, I think it's not. And originally, when we first started, we kind of heard that. But I think how we got in front of that is we want to make sure our students stay within our district, right? We believe in this one band, one sound model. And what happens is. When our enrollment pipeline has a leak, think about this, our students won't come into the district, they'll go out to another college that within five or 10 miles from us, particularly where our proximity of our colleges are. So we quickly was able to shift and look like, okay, this data is showing us that our students are here and we need some more students on the credit college. This is our low hanging fruit. And so when we start to again to look at the data together, we realized, you know what, one band, one sound, this is, this is our student. Whether they are non-credit to credit, this is our student. So how do we transition our student from non-credit to credit? And I think when we had that conversation, the entire team and presidents got that buy-in because they did see how many students we are um, impacted and enrolling in non-credit. Um, we have a big piece of the pie. And so that way we said, hey, as a district, how do we work together to ensure we sustain and give our students this quality education that we know they have? They've had a great experience with us in non-credit. So why not just transition these students um, to credit. And so we kind of identified that early and we just came up with that model, one band, one sound, and we began to work together. And uh, we just have wonderful faculty buy-in. I don't know how else to express that. Um, our curriculum faculty teach quite a few of our um, nine credit classes. And so there's not a lot of competition there uh, between the two, the tussling, because the passion just like Dr. Hester was saying, they're teaching the same subject. It doesn't matter whether it's a curriculum student or non-curriculum student. So I have to say our faculty buy-in is seeing the value of just educating students, irrespective of whether they're curriculum or non-credit, has not really been an issue with us here. So I think a range of experiences there, but this question of competition does come up, and I do think it starts with the vision, right? One college, one student, as Jackie and Antoinette were mentioning, um, but also just getting them in the same room, right? Getting your faculty and instructors in the same room to have conversations with one another, to understand the quality, to understand the opportunity and sometimes the missed opportunity when we're not taking advantage of these, right? Thousands, tens of thousands, in some case, students that that do um, enroll in non-credit each year. Um, I actually want to jump to another question from the audience that was asking. I think Jackie, this was um, you were mentioning. You now know how many learners you've converted into credit. Um, any chance you have those numbers on hand to share with the audience some of what um, the change has looked like over time? Um, we don't mark just finishing. We actually have a meeting scheduled before our next community of practice meeting um, to kind of go over that data. So I haven't seen the new data, um, but it looks like, but we've just been looking at our data that we get from our, our semesters from spring to fall, and we've seen an uptick. But one thing I, I would fail to mention is that our faculty have been meeting um, with other faculty at the credit college. And so what we've done in regards to seeing an uptick was we had small like learning sessions where our students were, once the semester was ending, 
that particular campus where they wanted to go to, that faculty would come in via Zoom and kind of talk about what are the next steps and kind of talk about their scheduling process and what that looks like. And so we've seen a huge turn, particularly with our um, college at City College, as well as Miramar, with having these um, relationships with the faculty. So in October, we'll be having our first um, faculty child development symposium so the faculty can get together. And so what we really wanted to be intentional about too is not really having this transactional relationship, right? So we talk about this one band, one sound. So how do we really begin to build authentic community amongst each other on a collegial level for faculty to really begin the trust and credibility and rapport? Because again, that does come into play. Like, I think we're, st we're still in students. No, it's the same student. So let's see how do we make sure we transition these students. So that's how we've really been intentional about having these small conversations to really build community. Because we want to just say, this is not a one-off. This is something we want to continue and to provide a, provide a blueprint, not only for the two pathways that we're looking at now, but particularly we've been looking at our other programs and how this same NCAL pathway will work to look at our, um, our our culinary program, or particularly like our automotive technology, that we have those same programs at our credit college as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I want to I want to jump to another question from the audience. Recognizing um, we're getting a little tight on time, um, and it's about organizational structure. So, so often non-credit and credit, right? They're in separate divisions. They have different leads. Maybe they, maybe in some cases, there's a report, uh, reporting line up to the president. Um, from your perspective, would it be better to have like programs like health sciences, for example, underneath um, one VP or dean rather than separated? Um, and I'll, I'll start by answering this question and saying, this is something we looked into in our Guide to More Unified Community College and really found it depends. Um, it is as long, really the goal should be collaboration across departments and sometimes merged departments is a great way to increase collaboration, but that's not always immediately available right now. In fact, in most of the places where we saw that, it was because there was some sort of like dean or VP transition that made it possible for the college to do that. So I'll kind of start there, but I'm curious how our three panelists would answer that question. I think it's important, right? When you talk about collaboration, I think we have to also understand our students have so many touches when they come through the door from student service to financial aid or to a counselor. So they have so many high touch levels that I think everybody needs to have a seat at the table. I think what happens sometimes we make decisions and those key people should be at the table where voices are heard and where they're actually doing something operational that impacts the student that you don't know about. But I think it's important. I think and that's why we have the NCAL champions, just to make sure that we're having the same messaging. You know, things change right away, right? And so not having those key people or players at the table makes that that student experience looks totally different. So I think with this one, either way, I think as long as you have people who are committed to the process, whether it's NCAL, whether what whatever initiative it is, you have to have people that are that are interested in the process and that you can gain their buy-in as long as that team has the synergy. And at the end of the day, we always come to the table and we say, what? It's about our students. So I think if we lead with that and continue to have that as our, as our North Star and model that we're serving students, this is the way that we impact students, I don't think initiative could fail. Great advice. I think for us, it's actually much easier to have them be separate and more from the labor side. So we're, because we're highly United State, um, it makes it much easier for the, we've got two, well, they may overlap. We have really two kind of um, sources of labor, for both instructors on both sides. If we were to combine them, that would get really messy really quick. And so keeping them separate, even though they may overlap at times, makes it much easier for us to operate and actually have those cross um, relationships because sometimes it's the same faculty, but they're on different types of contracts. And so for us, um, it really works better having them separate, but with a lot of the, a lot of things Dr. Hester just mentioned, uh, as long as those are in place, so. Yeah, and I'm gonna be honest, I couldn't imagine this particular work 
being done in a silo. And I think what this NCAT work was intentional about making us really get out of our comfort zones and out of the silos. I couldn't have done this work without my counterpart, Mar Masa et al, because it was just some things that I didn't know that happens on the credit side that he was privy to and vice versa. Um, if I didn't have someone in student services at the table, I wouldn't know certain things about the onboarding process when the student comes in and for them to kind of be able to speak to that. And so I think it's important that again, we have those key departments at the table because they work with those students every day, right? So they're they're able to see things from their lens that potentially be a bond spot for me um, in doing that. So I, I, for our team, I know it was infrastructure that way intentional and it, it really worked out for us. And I think that's pretty much what a one student service model is aimed at in terms of having it separate, but again, having the key stakeholders at the table, increasing that communication so that everybody knows what's going on. And again, <clears throat> working in the same direction in the same tone for the benefit, but ultimately for the benefit of our students. So it works again, as Dr. Hester so eloquently said, if we have all the right people at the right time, <laughs> um, putting in their input and you know, contributing to the whole effort and looking at it from a macro vision and then working down to make sure, see what we need to do in order to make sure that it's, it's successful. Excellent. Well, thank you all. If I am taking away anything today, I really think it is the importance of people, right? Um, so in our last minute here, just want to remind folks, we do have six impact briefs that go more in depth. I know we didn't get to all the questions today, um, but please feel free to download these impact briefs using the QR code here. And then if you want to reach out to me or Steve with any further questions, big thank you to the ECMC Foundation for funding this work. Um, I know uh, there's, there's lots, lots more to learn and to come. So thank you, everyone.